So as a result of all that work and activity, um, the, the, all the farms in Australia, if you're a, if you're a prawn farmer or a barramundi farmer or anybody who's put a farm in next to the uh, ocean, you have to uh, treat your uh, material prior to discharge or recirculation. And all farms have between 20 and 30% of the total pond area devoted to that, that activity to make them relatively um, you know, disconnected from um, you know, uh, discharge as it would be from agricultural land, runoff from sugarcane farms or whatever. Uh, a couple of examples here. So this is uh, actually the, Lo the Logan River, but the, uh, this scene, not untypical uh, from the um, eastern seaboard anyway, sugarcane, and these are the, this is a prawn farm. And so in terms of uh, this particular case that we're involved in, the prawn farm wanting to expand uh, into this area outlined in orange, uh, so a number of issues there. Uh, that it couldn't impact on the flood risk, needed to preserve the viability of the sugar industry, uh, optimising the land use economics, um, having no added environmental load of nitrogen, phosphorus or sediment into the Logan River. So quite an intriguing uh, um, set of, of problems into which you could use spatial modelling, economic modelling, etc., 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 which was done, and uh, also taking into account the relative economics of productivity per hectare of sugarcane and, and prawns. So we're good at this, and we're able to do it down to exquisite detail. And in fact, this sort of technology, uh, Australian researchers have been involved in in, in Vietnam and in Indonesia, etc., helping them make those those decisions. The net result was that uh, uh, putting all those factors together, uh, the council was able to grant a permit to increase this farm without having an adverse impact on uh, all those criteria. So we can do it, and we can do it at a huge scale. So. Um, here's just some broad scale analysis of the whole of the uh, northern coastline. That's a very extensive area we're talking about. So that study area from um, New South Wales round to Perth, that's about 13 million uh, hectares. And, and based on some fairly simple criteria, there's about 1.7 million hectares of coastal land potentially suitable for um, ponds, for barramundi or prawns or whatever you want to grow in that quite evenly distributed between Queensland, Northern Territories and WA. To put that into perspective, there are currently 1,000 hectares of, of prawn farms, about 4,000 metric tonnes, uh, about a $60 million uh, industry, tiny. Um, the industry's own target is to grow to about 5,000 hectares, about 25,000 tonnes, um, about a $375 million um, industry. So potential to expand, uh, but Will it do so? Well, I think uh, the words of the uh, Productivity Commission, these aren't my words, uh, that aquaculture production is subject to an unnecessarily complex array of legislation uh, and agencies. Uh, and so whilst in this case there have been demonstrably no adverse environmental impacts for 20 years of an industry operating at, you know, adjacent to the GBR, which is just one small region of that that is potentially available, um, this issue probably needs some attention. Okay, switching from environment into uh, the uh, um, breeding genetics, uh, the, one of the big differences between the emerging aquaculture industries and the more established uh, terrestrial agriculture, whether it's wheat or whether it's cattle, is that the aquaculture sectors are only just moving from wild or unselected stocks to selected breeding. So that means at this point in history, there's enormous um, benefits to be achieved by uh, selective breeding using combination of conventional breeding techniques and some of the tools of modern molecular um, biology. And I want to show you an example of that. So as the prawn farming industry that we work with has progressed from catching their broodstock with trawlers to growing their own broodstock in environments like this, these are these raceways or, or ponds, and then selecting their own broodstock, it's had an enormous impact. So in blue, you see farms stocked with the progeny of wild stocks, and in red, you can see uh, the uh, progeny um, ponds stocked with the progeny of selected stocks. And we've seen a progressive increase in the yields uh, to the extent that last year um, the, the yields were, these are the average yields from these farms of going from the, um, the standard average for Australian prawn farmer growing black tiger prawns about five tonnes a hectare 
these guys got an average of 70 and a half tons per hectare. So a 50 hectare farm that would normally have got 400 tons got 900 tons. That's another 14 million dollars into, um, you know, an SME's business. Um, that sort of uh, achievement, which you could not get in a mature um, beef industry or, or cat, um, um, chickens or whatever, attracted a lot of attention um, internationally. And, and so that's actually created an opportunity uh, that uh, if we think about it, we've got this region to the north of us that has a huge demand for seed stock and for uh, nutrients, which I'll come to, come to in a moment. So there is an opportunity for um, us to play into that um, regional demand in countries that are producing up to two and a half million tons and consuming them. So it's no longer a case that it would have been about five or 10 years ago, there may be some uncertainty about, well, aren't they just gonna flood the Australian market? No, this is for domestic consumption. One billion new uh, middle class uh, uh, people coming into, in, coming into middle class prosperity in our region in, in the next 10 years, and they're all seafood consumers. Okay, so the other big global issue I want to touch on is the issue of, uh, of what to feed the fish of the future, um, touching on aquafeeds, maxim maximizing productivity, becoming independent from fishery resources, that 30 million tonnes of wild harvest fisheries. Um, so increased raw material scope, what else can we use? Optimizing the feed rationing and delivery and, and technology transfer. So the reason that this fish meal story is so important can be reflected here in terms of aquaculture. Back in 2000, aquaculture used that much of the world harvest, wild harvest fish meal. It now uses this much. And in terms of fish oil, back in 2000, about half, now almost all of the wild harvest fish oil is used by aquaculture. As the industry is growing, that is simply unsustainable. So what are some of the solutions, some of the local solutions that might have uh, global uh, relevance? Um, so that's just showing the decline in, 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 the, in, the, in the production. For quite a while, Australia has been using um, legumes and grain products to replace fish meal proteins. Not perfect because it lacks some of the amino acids, but it's not a bad substitute. Um, but there's a much more profound um, opportunity here in that all these terrestrial plant industries produce um, waste products, either in the harvesting or processing or byproducts and waste. And uh, we in Australia have been able to develop some, some technology. Um, the uh, trademark for it is Novak. We're taking any of those raw, raw materials, it doesn't matter if it's waste from wheat or rice or um, from the brewing industry, putting it through a bioreactor process. Uh, the product is then harvested and dried um, and added to um, in this case, prawn feed, and so you now have a, a, a prawn feed plus this uh, material Novak. Um, the, the relevance of this, and I'm just going to show you one set of uh, results, combining the effects of the breeding that we've been able to do and using this new diet. So this, this trial, um, sorry, this trial uh, looks at a standard feed fed to um, the selected stocks, standard feed fed, fed, fed to the progeny of wild brood stock, uh, and then the standard feed plus Novak uh, with the same treatments. And these are the results. Okay, so bearing in mind that most um, prawn farmers in Australia and indeed the rest of the world um, that are using wild stocks get this sort of growth rates. So it's about uh, half a gram a week. If you um, feed those uh, progeny of wild stocks with this new diet, you get a pretty good um, improvement in growth uh, performance. If you feed elite stocks, these are selected stocks um, with a standard diet, this is the sort of growth rates you get. If you feed the elite stocks with the, uh, this new diet, uh, what you get is 198 um, uh, improvement in growth rates, which I think you'll agree is pretty spectacular, which again creates a real opportunity for Australia. So in terms of uh, in addition to working as hard as the Australian industry and R&D corporations and CRCs and industry and universities are to improve the production efficiency of our existing industries, there are very, very significant opportunities uh, in terms, in particularly in elite seed stock, but more uh, importantly in high quality feeds 
uh, from sustainable raw, raw materials to feed into the areas of the world. This is where 85% of the world's um, aquaculture, or that dramatic increase in production, this is where it's happening, right on our doorstep. There's an insatiable demand for the seed stock uh, and for the um, nutrients to feed the seed stock. And I believe that in addition to uh, what we're doing to improve production efficiency for domestically produced stocks, there's a huge opportunity for Australia to respond to those global challenges. So thanks very much.